Today, uh, we are here to celebrate Martin Luther King Day and discuss West Side history. I will be your panel moderator. Uh, my name is Deco Sane Wetzel, and we have a panel here filled with amazing African American researchers, historians, librarians, and um, everything in between. So um, again, my name is Deca Hussein Wetzel. I am with Urbanist Media. I am also the Black Science Researcher for the Cincinnati Preservation Association um, and uh, the host of the Urban Roots podcast. Uh, we have today with us Dr. Jackson. Uh, Dr. Eric Jackson is a professor of uh, African American history. He's a director of the Black Studies program at Northern Kentucky University. Um, we also have Key Parks, who's the West End branch manager with the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Library. And we have Laverne Summerlin, who is professor at uh, professor of English at the University of Cincinnati and the author of Gems of uh, the Cincinnati's West End. So today we are going to start by having everybody uh, speak a little bit about what they uh, can tell us about Cincinnati's West End history and their respective fields. So Dr. Jackson's gonna talk about uh, the early history. He is gonna talk about uh, libraries and education and Laverne is gonna talk about uh, the history of churches and um, young black folks in the West End. So we will start off by having Dr. Jackson talk to us a little bit about the early history of the West End. So, <clears throat> so to talk about the history of, of the West End, particularly the experience of African-Americans, you have to start with the, the migration of African-Americans to the state of Ohio in general. Um, Ohio becomes a state in 1803. And the next year in 1804, uh, Ohio Institute, what are called black codes. And in general, they try to stop their migration of African-Americans to this so-called free state. Um, it says that folks who are people of color, African-Americans who come to the state of Ohio must pay the state a security deposit of $500. So um, there's some contradiction that goes on in the state of Ohio when it talks about its, free, its freedom for people of color, but at the same time, it's creating barriers to stop African-Americans from moving into the state. Um, particularly in Cincinnati, Cincinnati officially um, was created in 1788, but the name Cincinnati is not uh, stated as the name of the city until 1790. Soon thereafter, African Americans start to move into the state um, slowly but surely, and they migrate to certain parts of, of downtown, what is now downtown Cincinnati, um, particularly places for what, uh, such as where the Freedom Center uh, currently stands, um, and also where Procter & Gamble current headquarters uh, currently stands, and those two communities becomes known as Little Africa and Bucktown, respectively. And so African Americans congregate to those communities for a number of decades, and slowly but surely the city starts to uh, change and grow, and um, governmental leaders start to direct African Americans to the West End, specifically intentionally by um, at that time, it's not called redlining, but it, it, it kind of functions as if redlining. Uh, they direct folks to the West End. The West End is the area during the, the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, um, becomes known as Porkopolis, where Cincinnati starts to produce certain items, um, dealing with pork products and warehouses. And so African-Americans are, are moved and driven into that community specifically. Um, there's also a mixture of poor whites in that area too. Um, um, there's a small group of Irish there in that community and Appalachian people are in that community. So those type of folks are intentionally driven into the West End um, for migration purposes and also for city planning purposes. And that will continue for numerous decades up until and a little bit past the American Civil War. Wow, that's that's a lot, a lot of a lot of a lot of really important information and things that I think that people need to really know about the early history and there was really a, a thriving African American community. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the things that people used to do for fun back in the day? So, um, 
fun is kind of relative. So fun meaning um, we're talking about a working class population in the West End mostly. So most of their time is focused on work, but they also have a family life um, that they um, do their normal things that folks did um, in their leisure time. They, they play ball, they, they um, ha have events in their communities. They have eventually um, after the Civil War reconstruction and the World War I, they create theaters, they create um, clubs, they create or civic organizations, um, and they thrive in that community. Um, they develop friendships, they develop churches and so forth. And so that becomes part of their leisure time. Um, they also, I mean, they create, I mean, there's an early uh, Negro League base, quote, Negro League baseball team in Cincinnati there also, and that, that comes out of the West End. And so they do the normal things that people normally do in their leisure time. And it's, it's, it's just a close knit community that's, that's thriving consistently um, um, from its origins up into uh, the 1940s. Yeah, in the 1940s um, onward, there was a lot of changes that happened there with urban renewal. Could you tell us some more about what that looked like and what people went through to, um, you know, what to kind of explain what, why it, it it looks the way it does today. So, so some of the changes are, are actually the vast majority of the changes is driven by um, the city itself, um, city hall. Um, they create a city plan that that literally it's called the master plan, and they want to develop a city that's reflective of racially identifiable communities based on race and class. And so they develop a planning strategy in which African-Americans are driven into that community and they're boxed into that community in particular by, uh, again, it's not called redlining yet, but it functions as if redlining existed of there's certain properties that people of color only can buy. Um, the whole banking industry is discriminatory towards African-Americans consistently. Um, and then eventually um, the, the community is, 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 is attacked by um, city planning activities from, the st from not only the city and the state, the federal government, you have um, the highway system moving into the West End and displacing thousands and thousands of African-Americans um, out of the community. And they have to figure out how to respond to that. And, and maintain at the same time their African-American businesses and churches and communities. Um, um, theaters like the, the, the Regal um, has to figure out how to survive and, 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 and still thrive under these um, horrible conditions of racial segregation and discrimination that's, that's attacking African-Americans on so many levels. Yeah, wow. That's it's just like really rough to to hear and kind of when you think back about what it looked like you know it was it was a thriving black community and today you know a lot of churches and schools and entertainment buildings like the cotton club that used to exist are, are gone and i know that the regal still stands and we're Correct. really fortunate that that the regal that you know the robert o'neill multicultural arts center and the port authority are really working together to to get this uh, this building saved and preserved and it's it's a really important symbol of community today so thank you so much dr jackson for sharing um we'll we'll double back and okay. have everybody speak a little bit more on um just like questions for everybody okay. um so to segue we're going to talk to key parks who's the west end branch manager at the cincinnati and hamilton county library and you know, I think what's important about what Key's going to talk about is the, the 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 connection between education, libraries, and these important institutions that used to exist that still exist today, um, and we'll kind of hear more about how how that has evolved over time. So, Key, what can you tell us about uh, libraries and education? All right. Um, so, library services in the West End um, started in 1908. 
at the Dayton Street branch and what was known as the Clearwater Homestead. Um, located behind Lafayette Bloom School on uh, Bay Miller Street, the Dayton Street branch was a two-story brick building uh, with a 150-seat auditorium. It also had the second highest circulation of materials behind the main library. Unfortunately, um, that building is no longer there um, today. Um, in the 1920s, though, when the African-American community began to grow in the southern portion of the West End, the Cincinnati Public Library opened a branch inside of the Harriet Beecher Stowe School, located on West 7th Street, where the Fox 19 office is now. It was founded by Jenny Porter to provide African-American children equal educational opportunities. The library, like the school, was on a mission to uplift Cincinnati's African-American community. Its first head librarian, Hattie Walker, possibly the first African-American um, librarian to work for the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library, helped support the school's mission um, by providing adult literacy classes and a collection filled with books by and about African-Americans. Um, then for a brief period of time in the 1950s, I found out, a book deposit station was set up in a recreation room in Laurel Homes on Lynn Street. It was staffed by Dayton Street Branch, Stowe Branch, and Maine Children's Department staff members. Um, it was primarily for students at Washburn School. However, the location of the deposit station between the two branches and more centrally located in the West End seemed to kind of like forecast the library's future location. Um, in, 19, in 1960 and 61, um, the Dayton Street and Stowe branches closed and sort of merged, uh, becoming the Lincoln Park Branch Library located down the street from the deposit station on Lynn Street. Um, the new branch was located on um, Lincoln Park Drive, which is now um, Ezra Charles Drive. Um, so um, it was designed by um, local architecture firm Glazer and Myers. The branch um, features a mid-century modern um, style with a floating accordion roof and an open concept design. Um, so um, now the branch is called the West End Branch um, and its um, location just celebrated its um, 60th anniversary in October um, 2021. <laughs> Okay, that is so cool. That is just so much new information that I've learned about libraries. Thank you so much, Key. Uh, so I guess just like a one follow up question, really, you know, I think we're all a little curious because we've heard Dayton Street is, you know, the formerly very white area, uh, you know, uh, mansions and a lot of, uh, you know, brewery owners used to live there. And those are definitely more white people, not African Americans. So, were African Americans allowed at the Dayton Street branch and other branches back in the day? Um, I believe they were technically allowed. And even when you look at old photographs, you see African Americans at the main branch downtown. Um, however, um, I do believe that the Stowe branch was um, created to kind of deter. African Americans from coming to the Dayton Street branch. Um, so before the Stowe branch, there was a colored branch in Frederick Douglass School in Walnut Hills. And the library um, reports um, from that time state that the large settlement of African Americans in the neighborhood couldn't adequately be cared for at the Walnut Hills branch. Um, so African Americans were probably allowed at the Dayton Street branch library, but they uh, may not have been welcomed until um, again, African Americans started to migrate further into the West End, so. Wow. <laughs> That's just crazy. Um, and you kind of talked a little bit about this, but is there anything else that you wanted to share about the history of like public school libraries? Um, because that, that that in itself is really interesting, like with the Harry and Beecher Stowe School and, and Jenny Porter, um, you know, were there were there other uh, library branches that were kind of important like that within other schools in the West End? I know that there were other um, public libraries located in schools. Um, but as far as I can tell, um, because it's something like I'm still like looking up and also like I'm still very curious about when it comes to um, the main library and, you know, how African-American patrons um, were treated in the main library and other branches. Um, but I do know that like those two branches were designated um, colored um, branches. Um, but I'm still trying to find out um, just more information about them. And we have like archives at the main and I enjoy like digging into them 
Um, but those two branches were really, um, the Douglas branch and the Stowe branch um, were really important branches located in schools that were um, generally for African-American children. Yeah, so it sounds like these, these also served the rest of the community. It wasn't just the children within the school. Yeah, they also um, like um, had like an similar to like how our libraries now have, um, you know, like right now, a lot of times the, our branch is considered like some people consider it a children's branch um, because we have such a large after school population. But before the children get there and even when the children are there, um, we do um, kind of um, support various social services um, and help with the digital divide and things like that. So African-Americans who are migrating to Cincinnati during that time um, are, were kind of faced with some, something similar, which was, you know, maybe because of working and things like that, um, maybe they weren't able to be educated, you know, the way they would like to. And again, that, you know, not having that education stops them from acquiring other opportunities. So um, it's almost the same thing, but. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Know. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's definitely uh, really fascinating because I don't think a lot of people really see the relationship between public schools and libraries and really understanding what segregation really meant and what, you know, the civil rights movement really led to a lot of, um, a lot of changes that I think we see today that we don't have the ability to reflect back on because, you know, we weren't there on that time. Um, or a lot of us, you know, the, the, it's, it's really hard, but there are those folks that we can speak to who have been there, who have talked to people who have been there, um, like uh, Laverne Summerlin, who's our next uh, panelist. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to Laverne here, who's the English professor at the University of Cincinnati and author of Gems of Cincinnati's West End: Black Children and Catholic Missionaries, 1940 to 1970. It's like the key time we're like trying to look back at too. We're like, you know, I want to know more about what people had to say back then. So Laverne, hi. Hi. I know that you uh, spent a lot of time, you know, when you wrote your book, uh, speaking to people in, uh, in the West End or from the West End, and you heard a lot of stories. Um, so I am very excited to hear about what you have to share about Catholic churches in the West End. And um, I might have a couple questions for you after your spiel. Okay. Actually, the reason I decided to write this book is because I have a habit of visiting different churches. And um, I attended Holy Trinity Church in the West, um, Holy Trinity Elementary School in the West End and Our Lady of Mercy High School in the West End. And when I would visit uh, predominantly black churches in Evanston, St. Mark, um, the poor is uh, out in Lincoln Heights or St. Andrews in Avondale. When I would visit those churches in the 70s through the year 2000, the thing that I noticed is that most of those churches were being kept alive because of the alumni, black alumni from the Catholic schools in the West End. They had been educated in the West End schools. So I said, there's a story here. So back in the day when I was in school, there were nine Catholic schools in the West End and only one is left and that's St. Joe. There were nine. Um, if you want to know the names, but I want to stick to this five minutes so we can deal with that later. But there were nine Catholic schools there. And I set out to interview or read about a hundred of the alumni. And I wanted to interview at least one person from each of those nine Catholic schools. And I was successful in doing that. The question that I asked them is was the education that you received in those schools, was it worth it to your parents? Was it worth it to you? And I also did some research about 
the various programs that the Catholic leaders had put in place to educate uh, black children as well. I did some research on two of these archbishops, one Archbishop McNicholas, he had his, what is referenced as the Negro apostolate of uh, welcoming black folks into the Catholic church uh, from 1925 to 1950. And then there's the Carl J. Alter urban apostolate. And uh, he was, he had a number of different programs welcoming black folks into the uh, Catholic church from 1950 to 1970. So that's why my book is dealing with that particular era. Um, in answering, uh, I, I wanted to know from these people, the ones that I interviewed, was the education that you received in those Catholic schools worth it to you, to your parents, to the church, okay? And the people that I interviewed all said, yes. They all said, yes. I also asked them, what was most important to you? The religious-based education, the academics, or the discipline? Now, back in the day, there was a, a all boys, uh, black Catholic high school, the poorest high school, only in existence 19 years, just 19 years. And that school has produced, and as a small school, I don't think they ever had over 100 students there. That school produced a number of people who were given livable wage jobs, which is what the black mother, the one black mother was saying, I want my children in that school because I know that they'll get them a job. And if they want to go to college, they'll see to it that they get in college. And the people that I interviewed were retirees from livable wage jobs or they had gone to college and finished and, and they were representative in a number of professional uh, organizations. So, but the interesting thing about that school is all male school. And with most of the people I interviewed of those three things, religious-based education, uh, ac ac academics, hold on. Uh, academics or discipline? What do you think they said? Tell me, what do you think was the answer? Was most important to them? Somebody, key, what do you think they said? Religious-based education, academics or discipline? What do you I think? I know they what said? they said. They said discipline. You'd already know, okay. Yeah. Dr. Jackson, <laughs> what do you know what they, discipline. what do you think? Discipline. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna go with discipline. That's what they said. Yep. And uh, the, the thing about that, especially, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the men for a second and my five minutes are up, so I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> but okay, you come from an all black school. As the one man said, he went on to become a principal in the public schools, whatever, an administrator in there, whatever. And he went back to teach there. But as a student, he said it was our school. We were not treated as outsiders. All of the leaders, the college, the, 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 the class presidents, okay, on down to anybody else. Everybody was black. Mm -hmm. And the priest and that coach Shans, they were very strict. They did not play. And when they got out of that cocoon, where the priests who were there were there because they wanted to be there, they wanted to teach black folks. When they got out of that cocoon, and they were dealing sometimes with educators who didn't think they could do A, B, or C. Started looking for jobs and got rejected because of race. It was the discipline, they say, mm -hmm. that kept them going. The one man I interviewed was in Vietnam, uh, got wounded three times in Vietnam. And he said, I kept going back because of that discipline. So there are many other things I could say, but I want to stop because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to honor your time. One thing I want to say, you no, know, Decca, is there's an interesting history of the Hauk House. They you know they just started using that house to film Shirley Chisholm's life. Yep. Okay. There's a history of the Catholic history of that Hauk House that I don't see written in any. I mean, there there are things written in Wikipedia, but they don't talk about those Catholic nuns that lived in that house for 30 years. Uh, uh, our, our, 
our Catholic Alumni Association used to meet in the, in the basement of that house. <laughs> I used to work there in that house uh, washing dishes for 50 cents <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Uh, the first black Catholic priest in in um, in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, Father Clarence Rivers. He went there. Those nuns taught him. The nuns that lived in that house taught him. Okay, when he said his first mass, he went and said his first mass privately for those nuns because of the important effect, uh, important role they played in his life. And on page one, I think it's 156 in my book, turn and see that nun sitting on the front step of mm -hmm. house, reading to that little black girl. I'm finished. Mm -hmm. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've exceeded my five minutes. So. No, you're fine. This is super great stuff. Um, I definitely would love to see an, uh, uh, an article on that. That would just I'd, uh, like, let's, 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 let's get that. Let's get that together. Cause that would be something I think that would be really nice to, to, I think CPA would really appreciate the fact that, you know, there is this rich history of this, this, this building that is not just tied to a wealthy brewer. Um, so that's mm -hmm. pretty powerful stuff. It really ties in, you know, that these, these changes over time in this neighborhood have really, you know, they've, really helped it create a strong vibrant black community that's withstood so much unnecessary uh, physical changes the highway coming through urban renewal mm -hmm. the kenyan bar project which i know we didn't specifically call out but the kenyan bar project is essentially what the the impetus for you know this large scale urban renewal in queensgate mm -hmm. developing uh, and the even earlier than that, uh, the early development of public housing um, mm -hmm. in the late 1930s. And mm -hmm. then now when you go into the West End, you see all this public housing and then you see, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of uh, residential buildings as well. Mm -hmm. But what you don't see anymore are these churches and these schools. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. luckily the Regal still exists. St. Joe's mm -hmm. still exists. And mm -hmm. uh Harriet Beecher Stowe School still exists. So we do have those things that we can uh, preserve. So that's really great. Um, so thank you, Laverne. Thank you all. I, I guess I only have a couple questions that really just, you know, touch on what, how you feel these changes have impacted people's lives today, right? This, the, the changes over time, like urban renewal and, and um, the history of public housing and, um, you know, the kind of rise and fall of really important institutions as well, you know, so what, 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 have, what are those changes, um, you know, how have they impacted people's lives today? Open question to everybody. So, so here, here's, here's my, my take on it. It's, it, it's, it's complex, complex, meaning there's, there's always been some sort of, uh, negative and positive or, or, or uplifting in, in peaks and valleys kind of perspective for me. For example, when, 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 when we're talking about education for African-Americans, particularly in the West End, you have to also connect it to education for African-Americans in general in Cincinnati for, because Cincinnati becomes in the 1860s, 1870s, and up to the, the early 1880s, they're one of the first cities who have their own independent, quote, colored public schools. Um, they have their own teachers, their own principals, their own schools, and they educate their own people, and there's a growing middle class there that not only stretches into the West End, but throughout the city. Uh, and so those skill sets that, that were talked about earlier is not just for folks in the West End and it, it's it's part of the the legacy of African American entrepreneurship that you can still see alive today. It may not manifest itself in the traditional ways, but it's still there today. That African American entrepreneurship has not died. It's still there. It's just manifested itself in different ways. So, and and how African Americans responded to. Uh, the federal excuse me the federal highway cutting through the west end in 1944 
went to Federal Highway and then uh, master plan in Cincinnati in the 48. That wasn't just a Cincinnati problem. That's an American problem that the highways cut through black neighborhoods across the country in the same way. But African-Americans figure out a way how to persevere. I mean, that's what we do. We figure out a way how to, to persevere. So uh, it's not just this story about the downtrodden, just about a way, the story about how to adapt and continue and persevere despite your circumstances. And so that's that's my kind of uh, take on preservation and, and how African-Americans function. They figure out how to persevere just because that's what people of color do. That's what we've always done. Yeah, I, would, I just want to add uh, real quick that, you know, that perseverance, when, when you to go back looking at it, the West End housed almost 5% of the city's entire population. 25,000 residents were spread out over tens of thousands of dwelling units. And then this urban renewal happened and it, it really changed the landscape. So really, you know, that's, that's the kind of context there is that it really perseverance and, and what you're saying is, you know, only because of what people had to endure. So I'm sorry, Laverne, please uh, share what you have to oh, say. Okay, no, actually what I was going to say is that um, in, uh, <clears throat> in Gems of West End and the preface, I, I mentioned all the negative things people had to say about our neighborhood. It's the West End, is this, it's not that, it's what, oh no, I mean, check out the preface. All that negative stuff they said about the West End. And my response to that, everything they said was true, all that negative stuff. But what they said was not everything. And so in the first chapter, it's called Cincinnati's West End, a bridge away from a slave state is the title of that first chapter. And in that chapter, what I did was talk about the disadvantages of living in poverty and the advantages and how sometimes those disadvantages were, our van uh, were advantages to us. When I think of my mother and how strong she had to have been, I'm not that strong. You're dealing with the racism, you're dealing with raising other people's kids, cleaning other people's houses, cooking for other people, then coming home and doing the same thing for your own, catching buses. Such tremendous strength. A reporter interviewed me a couple of weeks ago and my book was on my desk and that's what she was interviewing me about. And she said, you all look so happy. This young lady, as it turned out, had lived and had never even associated with any black folks up there in the Northern part of Ohio from some rural town, okay? So she, she looks at this picture of these ghetto children and hey, we were dressed up because it was our graduation picture, okay? We dressed, that's the last time I wore a hat like that in my whole life, it was eighth grade, okay? She said, you look happy, I said, we were. I mean, she was shocked because she, she knew all the negative stuff that people had written about, about growing up in poverty. But she didn't realize, as Dr. Jackson said, like how important those churches were, not just the Catholic churches, but all of them. Those churches provided a community, not just in support of the schools, but just in support of the families as well. So what's happened? A number of people, as the schools, got decent jobs, got an education, survived. But they survived because they, many of them would talk about, yeah, it was, it was rough, but we survived. We learned how to survive. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> Key, do you have anything to share? No, I just, you know, just listening to, you know, <laughs> all this knowledge, it's wonderful. I, I mean, agree. I do think that what's, you know, uh, you know, being kind of like a, a community center in the West End by working at the West End branch, I do think, you know, I think about that a lot. Um, some of the advantages that the community does have is like its walkability um, and that there are various community resources, um, not as many as there were, 
but they still are there. You know, the fact that there's four plus schools in the, the neighborhood, um, the rec center, um, like in the summertime, it's one of the most beautiful things to see these kids walking um, to Lincoln Recreation. It, you would think that there's a beach <laughs> you know, down yes. there, it's one of the, yes. the most beautiful oh, yes. sights, these, you know, yes. um, folks walking, that, that's their, their life, and it's, you know, yes. they come to the library for a little bit, and they play games, yes. and then they go to the pool, you know, so, like, just seeing things like that, or, like, there's other beautiful things, even though I don't know how they do it, like, one thing that they enjoy is um, finding those bird scooters, and, you know, like, that's, like, a big thing. So, like, mm-hmm. I do enjoy, you know, just seeing them being kids, you know, um, and having having that joy and being able to to try and, and add to that. Um, so I do think that, you know, there, the community has a lot of, that does have a lot of advantages and opportunities. Um, and, yes, it does have, a, you know, a significant amount of public housing, but I feel like, you know, it needs to be leveraged and the community needs to be leveraged for the people who live there. There's some wonderful people who live there and um, there needs to be even more community spaces um, Mm -hmm. and um, and entertainment and things like that. Cause I just think that, you know, like I, I see those kids, you know, and I'm just like, you know, there's all these other entertainment things spread throughout. Like I'll go to a trampoline park and like, why isn't there a trampoline park in the West End? You know, why isn't there a skate rink in the the West End again? You know, why are they these things? And, you know, there's so many kids in this neighborhood who would, you know, enjoy that. So definitely, you know, the last question I have here, I think you've already answered is just like, what do you love about the West End? Um, And it sounds like the, what exists is, you know, something to really appreciate the the institutions that do exist right the library the rec center and then the the fact that these you know kids are still living in a, in this community and 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 even today without as many amenities they still find ways to make it work and there's so many parks like yeah. i live in bond hill we only have like one park like mm-hmm. there are so many parks that um are in the community that's mm-hmm. awesome Oh yeah, I get that. I get that. That's fabulous, uh, Dr. Jackson um, Laverne. Any anything you want to say about you know, what you love about the West End? I love the people. Yep, I love the people. I, I love um, the people that we grew up with, um, because actually, <laughs> when we look at every every everything, what is it? It's the people. It's the relationships, all kinds of characters. Peanut Jim, Dr. Jackson knows about <laughs> Peanut Jim. Daka, do you know about Peanut Jim? No, you have to share with me and, and our yeah. audience who probably doesn't know. Uh, Key, Key knows. Uh, Peanut Jim was the first uh, black entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> all the kids in the neighborhood knew about <laughs> Peanut Jim because that's uh, 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 Crosley Field, yep. the Reds baseball oh. facility. Okay. Yep. Uh, he would dress up in his tuxedo and his top hat. You can <laughs> you can you can Google him or YouTube him, or whatever you want. You'll yep. see what I mean. And we'll and he had his, and he had his bow ties, all dressed to kill and whatever. <laughs> and, he, and he was out there selling peanuts. Yep. He's out there selling peanuts. Now John Harshaw in his book about the West End tells you he swears that that uh, Peanut Jim had a lot of money. <laughs> yep. Made a lot of money selling those peanuts. And he talks about Peanut Jim's property he owned or whatever. But he was a character. Mm-hmm. He was a character that we admired. Yep. Okay. Um, Mr. Foster, the black grocery store owner, we admired him. Just little bits and, well, naturally, the black women who did our hair, you know, so uh, they were business people as well. But but it, it's it's it, it's the people, and and you meet. Uh, I mean, you know, my godmother and so many of those older people who would work around the parish and kept the parish going. They cared about us. They loved us, and we loved them. Wow, that's great. That's super great to hear. 
thank you everybody for being here for being on this panel for sharing everything good about the west end um i know that i learned some stuff i'm sure our audience will have learned a lot um thank you guys so much thank you thank you thank you